distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. Good afternoon and welcome to our first workshop of the afternoon of the fifth IKEA World Aviation Forum Innovation Fair. My name is Nivin Murat, Associate Analysis Officer with the Air Navigation Bureau. I will be your moderator this afternoon. We are delighted to have great panelists from the industry to discuss innovation in aviation. Please join me to welcome our distinguished guests for this first, first workshop. Ms. Christine Simard, Program Manager at Teraxion. <laughs> Mr. Serge Beranger, Senior Vice President, Innovation at Group Letequer. <laughs> Mr. Pablo Lopez Loches. Innovation Project Manager at IENA. <laughs> Mr. Alan Ubertin, President and Chief Executive Officer of the Consortium for Research and Innovation in Aerospace in Quebec. <laughs> Ms. Sandra Burschaefer, Chief Executive Officer, Airbus Exo Alpha. Ms. Anne Carnal, Program Manager, Operations Improvement, Future Airports at the International Air Transport Association. <laughs> and Ms. Nina Brooks, Director, Security Facilitation and IT at Airport Council International. The workshop objectives are to discuss the challenges faced by the industry when dealing with innovation. In more details, we want to discuss the following questions. What challenges you had to overcome to be where you are right now? And what new challenges do you foresee in the future? Second question, what do we need to easily enable innovation in aviation? What are the biggest challenges in adopting innovation? Third question, what are the economical and societal benefits of innovation? I will now invite each panelist to share their point of view. We will start with Ms. Simard. Ms. Simard, what challenges your company had to overcome to be where you are right now, and what new challenges do you foresee in the future? Well, Teraction is a small business, so I think our challenges are very much related to the size that we have. Uh, we are located in Quebec City, so we are a three hours drive, uh, roughly east uh, of Montreal. So we are small and somewhat isolated from the rest of the aerospace community that is uh, around Montreal. And we manufacture, we design and we manufacture components, optical components, so we are specialized in, uh, in photonics. So the activities that we have in aerospace are more or less all under the umbrella of the SASH program, the, uh, the uh, program that is sponsored by the government of Quebec for a greener aircraft. So we're developing uh, two modules for that, one for navigation, the other one for communication. So I think that in the past years, the biggest challenge that we, uh, we foresaw for us was, and I, I, I'm using a word that is probably too hard, but it's more ignorance of the industry, let's say, because uh, to us it seemed to be a very complex and very full of regulation industry, so, so that was hard for us to, to see our value into that industry and how we could bring innovation to it, because obviously we have been in business for 20 years where we have survived a lot of things, and this is because we can innovate and because it is also because we, can, we are very agile in, in what we do. So, so I would say that it's more a question of uh, maybe a little reluctance of not knowing the industry very well. But I guess that one good way we found to, to overcome that was uh, we were able to find excellent partners uh, to help us understanding the different applications and the requirements and the regulations, uh, especially uh, from our governments, from the province of Quebec and also from the government of Canada, and also from industrial partners. So I think that the industry needs to be prepared, let's say, to help small businesses like Direction 
to uh, to overcome those challenges, know more about the industry, and and benefit also from what we can bring. So we have a skilled workforce. We have lots of ideas. Uh, so I think this will be mutually beneficial to to all of us to involve more small businesses into the industry. Thank you, Ms. Simard. Mr. Beranger, what can you tell us about how your group is viewing innovation and did it change over the years? What are the challenges you foresee in the future? Hello, everybody. Very happy to be here and to try to, to put some messages from uh, this old company that is Latecoe. It's a one century old uh, old lady uh, uh, that survived a lot of crisis over time. Uh, some of them are, are very uh, are still there because uh, 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 we we suffered a lot from uh, from 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 difficulties in um, in in operation. And in what I can say is that during that period when time is difficult, it's difficult to innovate because uh, you do not get the attention of everybody when. Uh, finance is taking over. So there are gaps, there are gaps and, uh, and some t sometimes, some period of, t of time in, during which there was no innovation uh, within that uh, Recently, we, we could fix that and we decided to, uh, uh, thanks to the, uh, 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 the reorganization and, uh, and the financial cure that had been applied to the group in 2015, we decided to put back the thrust on innovation. And, uh, and that, that being uh, uh, threefold. The first one, uh, we decided to build demonstrators because innovation is just, uh, uh, is not only trying to invent something, some cool technology in a garage, but it's also being able to explain it, show what we can do, what we can bring in terms of uh, value to the market. Uh, the second one is, to develop technologies. You still need to develop technologies and make sure, because we fly aircraft, that these technologies are robust, uh, reliable, and do not endanger the safety of people. So that is a, a lot of, of, of constraint that is driven and, and controlled by regulation. But these regulations uh, uh, are not in favor of innovation. So we need to account for that and make sure that uh, uh, we do not pass uh, uh, the limits that would uh, uh, endanger uh, the safety of flight. So that's a real key uh, uh, parameter that needs to be considered every day. Uh, uh, and the third one is that we also need to invent the new way of manufacturing. So new ways of manufacturing is of course coming with uh, digitalization, but also um, I would say flexibility in our uh, organization, industrial organization, capability to produce, going for automation, and managing the impact on people that this automation is uh, uh, bringing, with, uh, uh, together with a, with a reduction of uh, a number of people at work. So that's what I wanted to say. Thank you, Mr. Beranger. Mr. Lopez Loches, do you think that being a state-owned company gives you more or less latitude to innovate? Well, hello. Um, for those of you who don't know AENA, the company where I work, um, we are an airport operator company. We manage 46 airports in Spain and two heliports. And also we manage airports abroad, uh, London Luton in the UK, and 16 airports in Latin America, in Mexico, Colombia, and Jamaica. And also from next year, we're going to start managing six new airports in Brazil. And yeah, it's true that we have an unusual situation because the 51% of our company belongs to the government, to the state, and the 49% belongs to private stakeholders. So we had, let's say, like the both uh, good and bad things for, from both sides, from private and public corporations. Um, I wouldn't say that our situation is less or more difficult to innovate than for other, co for other co corporates. I would say that we have to find our right ways to innovate. Uh, what can we do? 
for innovation. Uh, it's true that if we want to hire a, a company, we cannot contract them directly because we have to make public tenders. So sometimes in innovation, this is a little bit difficult because just one company has one innovative product or service that you want, and we cannot contract them directly. But uh, what we have found, or we, we usually do, is to make a, a short agreement with a short period of time to test the technology, to validate the technology, and to allow this kind of company to develop their, their technology in our facilities. So this is a way that, and, and I'll say a quick way to, to innovate with the, that kind of companies. And also, uh, we have different innovation programs. For instance, we are going to launch a, a startup accelerator. So it will be more easy for us, it will be easier for us to, to work with startups than with other kind of companies because startups usually have uh, innovative products that are very interesting for us. And with the accelerator, uh, we could work with them very quick, let's say. But as I said before, it's not more difficult uh, innovating in our corporate than in others. Just we, you, we have to find our specific ways to do it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lopez Loches. My next question is from Mr. Obertin. What are the biggest challenges or roadblocks your consortium had to overcome to foster collaborative research in the aerospace sector? Thank you. Uh, nearly 20 years ago, there were leaders from the aerospace industry in Canada and leaders from academia who decided to get together to create a new entity called CREAC, the Consortium for Research and Innovation in Aerospace in Quebec. Uh, and uh, they decided to put forward guiding principles to foster collaboration. They were used to fund research chairs. They were used to fund internship programs at one university or at one college. But one of the guiding principles was to really support collab collaborative research projects with at least two industrial partners plus two uh, universities or college in each project. So right from day one, they decided to embed collaboration in the program. The second guiding principle was to have a, an open IP policy to not only co-share uh, the risk, uh, share the risk of developing the new technologies, but ensuring also that everybody was getting a share of that IP in its own field of application going forward. So that created a real momentum and engagement uh, of the various partners. Um, at the beginning, they were on both sides of the table, one side industry, on the other side academia. But throughout the years, with these guiding and pr principles that we uh, put forward, we really changed the momentum and changed the culture. And now what we have in the network is really an open innovation culture where we can mobilize so easily our, partner, our partners here in Montreal and the greater uh, province uh, of Quebec. And on that base, uh, the Canadian government decided to launch a second consortium in 2014 called CARIC, now engaged in the, its renewal with our colleagues uh, with GARDEN. So the future is bright in terms of um, this model of open, uh, open innovation and collaboration. So these obstacles were uh, building trust, uh, engage the people, engage the researchers who get all the other you know, programs of it that there are other programs available in Canada so they can be funded by other ways, but to engage them on real industrial problems, that created also a difference for the training of the students and the highly qualified personnel that the industry uh, is still needing, uh, is still needs today. So today there are 150 members engaged in the, ne in the network. We've been able to uh, co-fund with industry nearly 200 partnerships. Again, complex partnerships with several partners, sometimes with international collaborators in different countries. And for the future, one of the biggest challenge now is, uh, is uh, as it was mentioned during this last two days, aviation is changing. It changes fast. Uh, trade barriers are rising and no one can do it alone. So that is why our job now is really to engage with the other, other innovative ecosystems. 
there is a bunch of inno innovative ecosystems in the digital domain and materials, and, uh, and they've been funded uh, in the past, uh, and uh, they have good ideas, they have bright researchers engaged in these uh, networks. So the biggest challenge now that we are facing is to stimulate the co-evolution co of our industry jointly with the, uh, the other innovative ecosystems and to expose the new ideas, new approaches, new methodologies coming from the, for example, the artificial intelligence domain to the industrial requirements of aviation in order to create and support that co-evolution. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Aubertin. My next question is for Ms. Bur Schaefer. Ms. Schaefer, what new challenges do you foresee in the future? So we are not quite as old as La Tecoère, but still we have celebrated our 50th anniversary or birthday this year. And we have been pioneering at Airbus aerospace industry ever since then. And if we are today the major player we are, it is because innovation was at the heart of our DNA. With the 330 back there, with the, the A300, sorry, back there 50 years ago, we started flying on large commercial airplanes with two engines. Uh, with our single life family, we introduced fly-by-wire. We, we went to a two-man cockpit, which were all revolutions at their time. And what we see today is that the world, as you mentioned it, is changing at an even faster speed than it has been doing before. And innovation needs to be still at our heart to be able to actually provide the services to our end customers they are expecting. So do I have a crystal ball of what the future will look like? No, but I'm absolutely convinced that aerospace industry will undergo tremendous changes. There are facts out there you have all heard about in the last two days, uh, growing population, congested airspeed, potential shortage of trained pilots, the environmental impact of our industry. These are a number of changes to which we need to find solutions. And we at Airbus are committed to pave the way to sustainable aviation for our future generations. But I think it's worth also to say that a lot has already been done if with the help of IATA, of ACI of ACCI AIA, sorry, just to name a few, we have already achieved a lot and there is more to do. And for example, we are presenting a white paper on automated formation flight this Friday on ICAO that I hope will get your support, but that can already bring very substantial uh, means to actually reduce our carbon footprint in the very next years to come. This can be short-term gains, there will be long-term gains, and in order to actually um, get ready for these breakthrough technological changes, we have created a subsidiary of Airbus, which is Airbus ExoAlpha. It is our innovation lab. In 2017, we found it was necessary to go that way, to be actually able to revolutionize the way we innovate. What we aim for is to shape the future of aerospace. Today, we aim to fly future technologies today, and we aim to accelerate the traditional research cycles. We want to go beyond classical research cycle and prototype to actually achieve proof of concept in a real environment at a convincing speed and scale. You mentioned demonstrators. Uh, what we aim to do is actually taking a technology which is not mature today, but we actually mature it together with or in the same time as we are actually building the demonstrator. And in a time frame from two to four, five, four years maximum, we want to get actually a knowledge about is this technology viable? Have we understood all the hurdles in the ecosystem around it? So it's not only about the technology, but it is how do we incorporate it on the platform? How do we deal with operations? How do we deal with regulations? How do we deal with standardization? How do we have a look at the global thing to actually make it a mature product as soon as anyhow possible. Uh, and I've talked a, a number of times already about a few of, of our demonstrators, but I think it's worth to mention again our IFAN X demonstrator, which aims to fly a two megawatt hybrid electrical airplane. 
you all know we have heard a lot about electrification. That is probably a solution for urban air mobility right now. It is not a solution for bigger airplanes. The 350 will not fly electrical in the very, very near future. But hybrid electrification is definitely a way to go. And we want to make it a reality. And we have committed to fly the demonstrator by 2021 to actually be able to integrate all that ecosystem and to provide the route for our future developments. So I think to, to make a long story short, innovation has been at our uh, heart and it is, still is and I think it's essential. We are open-minded, we look at the new technologies, at the new ecosystem and together we combine them to actually make greater products and services for our customers. Thank you, Ms. Burshaefer. Ms. Karnal. Can you tell us about the challenges IATA is facing when you seek for approval or buy-in from your member airlines for an, inno for an innovative new process or system? Thank you. So uh, problems for our airlines um, in the industry when we want to do things differently. I don't think the airlines have a different view from the problems that have been mentioned by several people that have spoken before. Um, firstly, it's around what actually is the problem? Do we agree on what our objective is or what we want to, to achieve by changing something? And I think that's where it's been important to have collaboration, to work together, working together with ACI and with other industry players to be clear on what we're trying to achieve. And through then achieving that, if you are clear of what your objectives are and your vision, your goal of what you want to change is, is, is understood, then of course the next question an airline will typically ask is how much is this going to cost? Unfortunately, aviation isn't exactly the most lucrative industry and our profit margins amongst airlines is particularly slim. So we will only be looking at implementing solutions that improve passenger cargo customer experience um, such that uh, we improve efficiency and we better use the infrastructure that we currently have available. Which again for airlines creates another question because a lot of airlines operate using very legacy systems and to swiftly implement or even trial a new process or a new, um, new uh, technology is often quite tricky to do. But I would say actually the the primary thing that people say when you suggest changing something in aviation is you can't because of regulation. And that actually, I think, is a false assumption that you can't because of regulation. I think it's partly because the regulations often were written in a different time, so the language is now subject to interpretation, and the language wasn't necessarily written to reflect an objective-based regulation. So you're often questioning whether you can or can't do something, or rather than whether you can or can't achieve something. Um, so, you know, replacing a uh, a uh, mobile phone, uh, your boarding card, from using a paper one, you know, you'd read a regulation and it would refer to paper. So you're thinking, oh, well, I can't do that. Whereas actually, the, the, having your boarding pass on a mobile didn't really cause a problem in terms of which you what you wanted to achieve. So in all that innovation work, it is really important that the regulators um, are involved in those conversations not only to explain what they want from their regulations, but also to advise on how they wish their regulations to change and what processes they wish, wish, wish to achieve so that it can be better for us all. Thank you, Ms. Karnal. My next question is for Ms. Brooks. Ms. Brooks, what is according to you the biggest challenge the airports will face in the next years with respect to security, facilitation, or IT innovation? Thank you. Um, it, it's a big question, um, and I think there are kind of two parts to it. The first is the challenges that airports face in their day-to-day -day operations, and then there's the challenges that they face in innovating. Um, and I'll try and briefly address both of those a little bit. Um, 
you know, airports are very complex environments. I, I personally think they're incredibly interesting. They bring together so many process, processes, controls, um, different people, stakeholders, customers, and this really complicated system that needs so much coordination, communication. It's really the perfect environment for innovation. It offers so many opportunities. Um, some of the challenges we've already talked about um, in this conference, growing passenger numbers, the need to become more efficient, um, changing service expectations from firstly the aging population, the need to be responsive to the needs of people with reduced mobility, um, but then also being able to provide excellent service to those who want automation, they want everything mobile, the millennials who want a different way of doing things. Um, we need to be able to look forward to accommodating multimodal transport connections. Um, we've seen lots of very exciting um, ideas about um, air taxis and, and, and drones this week, and I think we can expect to see more of that. Um, and then back on the ground, security um, threats are evolving, and they'll continue to evolve. We can expect um, security to continue to be a major concern, um, including drone disruption. And then with all this connectivity and all this innovation, cybersecurity obviously comes to the top of our, our list of concerns and something that we really have to think about when we're designing new systems. We have to design cybersecurity in. Um, also environment, you know, airports and, and more broadly the aviation community are, are committed to reducing climate impacts and have invested billions of dollars um, to reduce CO2 emissions and will continue to do so. So that, again, is ripe for innovation. Um, and then how to harness all this data, coordinating with partners, working with the airlines, how do we use that data uh, to use AI, become more efficient, more accurate in what we're doing? So that's the challenges side of things. And then I think I would agree with what many people have already said in terms of, of what are the challenges in innovating. Um, I think the, the minister from Singapore put it very well this morning when he said regulation needs to be innovation friendly. Um, that's certainly something we need. You, you can't, innovation can't thrive in an over-regulated environment. Um, and I think the assembly will be addressing a lot of that in, in the coming week. Um, for me, it's also about partnerships, building partnerships between industry, manufacturers, entrepreneurs, and government. We've seen a, a lot of success in trialing, testing, and learning, and working with partnerships with government to be able to prove that things work and show that the security is still there, the safety is still there, and that they are successful. And I think, you know, time and time again, that's been successful, and that will be a great model for the future as we move forward. Thank you, Ms. Brooks. I would like to ask Mr. Lopez Loches uh, the question: What do we need to easily enable innovation in aviation? What are the biggest challenges in adopting innovation? Mm, well, for us, mm, we have a lot of big challenges uh, regarding innovation. Mm, I think one of the most important ones is, is to increase our capacity without increasing our infrastructure, because we have a problem of limit. We cannot expand our airports as much as we want. So we have to make our processes more efficient and more um, for a passenger with a better experience. So this is one of the main challenges we want to face in the future, I think. And also is the sustainability and climate change challenge. I think it's something mandatory for all corporates uh, right now. Uh, we have a really ambitious plan to reduce our emissions in the next few years and be net zero carbon neutral in our airports. And we are planning to do different projects to achieve these, these ambitious goals. And also, uh, regarding the passenger experience, one of the main challenges we want to face in the future is the aging of the population, because population tends to be more aging every year, and in the future will be a lot of aging population. So we must use innovation and technology to, um, to make better the passenger experience in, in this specific scenario. Thank you, Mr. Lopez Loches. In the last uh, five minutes, uh, I would like, uh, we heard a lot about what are the challenges that each of you had to overcome, uh, what we need to easily enable innovation. 
in aviation. But I really would like to summarize with you, and the question is for all the panelists, what are really the economical and societal benefits of innovation? Why we do innovation? Whoever wants to uh, answer this question, please, please feel free. Yes, I uh, just uh, in, in terms of, um, I started to discuss that uh, shortly uh, when we, and it's not only for, for, for aerospace, but when we improve and when we rework the way we produce, the way we design our aircraft and all the environment that comes with it, uh, uh, we face a global challenge of uh, uh, maintaining uh, uh, people at work, maintaining the skills and making sure that this capability of developing safe flight uh, uh, is still there over, the, over, over time. Automation is, uh, is, uh, can help. It can also reduce the capability to do, to do that. The second point uh, on societal challenges is something that is really frustrating me uh, every day is the bashing on aerospace that we face every day on the papers. And that, is, that reflects uh, something that is, uh, I believe, obvious for the aerospace industry is our poor capability to communicate as a group of, of uh, uh, as a domain, as an industrial uh, sector. And this is something that needs to change with facts and data and not beliefs or opinions or, I would say, mediatic uh, 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 harassment that is uh, uh, today not at the right scale. And, and we should explain people that uh, we have been uh, uh, optimizing uh, our flying object, all our aircraft, we've been doing that for years. Uh, uh, the reason why we do that is because it's what you need to do when you fly an aircraft, is that you need to optimize it. You need to reduce its consumption and uh, optimize as, uh, it as much as you can. So we should, uh, I think, globally uh, uh, try to get organized in order to better communicate as a group and not as a Seat, set of individual companies. So that's what I wanted to say. Thank you, Mr. Beranger. Yes, Miss. Yeah, if I may, I would like to to compliment on what you said uh, about safety. We, I think, all agree that there will be a big technological change in the years to come. We see all these flying uh, e vehicles flying taxis, just to name a few, but there will be other things coming up in aviation. And I think we have really to, to have in mind that uh, commercial aviation has set a track record in safety and we need to remain there. So every new player coming in will have to be at the safety level standard we have set in the last years in commercial aviation. And innovation will help us to do so. If we ta talk about um, UAM, you need anti-collisions. There are lots of things you, you need to actually make it a safe place. Uh, and the hurdles to overcome are big because the expectation of the population is to have right from the entrance something as safe and trustworthy as commercial aviation has become over the last years. And innovation will definitely be extremely important for that. Thank Just you, Ms. Bur Schaefer. Yes, Ms. Karna. Sorry to interrupt. <laughs> Just picking up on the, uh, that from an airline perspective, though, I think it is really key that, that we have created that sense of safety within the industry, and our safety record is not something we should uh, um, disregard. It's going to take continual innovation and effort as the risks change, as the technology changes to maintain that safety record. But once you have that bedrock of, a safe, of safety and that, that there is trust by passengers when they get on an aircraft, then you do start to focus on that customer experience and that you're actually making sure aviation and flying is a pleasure and the whole experience from end to end is a joy and a choice and a choice that people want to make because they want the experience of going and socializing and being somewhere else. And I think that in that, it's difficult for aviation because people don't fly like we do every other week. They probably fly once, I think the average is once every 20 months. 
And if you consider the technology change that has happened in their phone in that 20 months, the airline has to keep pace with that, the industry has to keep pace with that to deliver not just an outstanding experience when people fly, but actually just an experience that matches what they do with their banking, with their um, social media, with the, everything that happens in their day-to-day -day life. And so we must keep pace with other industries within aviation to ensure that uh, it's still an attractive way of traveling. Thank you, Ms. Carnell. Yes, Ms. Brooks. Thank you. Um, I think when we're talking about societal benefits of innovation, we have to look at the benefits of aviation in general. And I think we know that aviation create, creates and supports jobs and communities. It encourages tourism and business. Um, and innovation and helps us to support those objectives and keep growing um, and bring those social benefits with it. Uh, innovation helps us allow people with, with disabilities or reduced mobility to be able to be mobile, to go on the trips they want. Um, it helps us address environmental issues and all of the things you know, like safety, security and efficiency. Um, but I think you know, overall innovation is going to help us continue to be to be successful and support um, mobility in the world. So that for me is the biggest thing. Thank you, Ms. Brooks. Ms. Simard, would you like to comment on that question? Um, I may have another comment is that uh, innovation fosters education and education also fosters innovation. So I think that we should not forget that in aerospace like in anywhere else, when we want to sustain innovation and we want to nurture innovation, we also nurture foster education at the same time. That's my comment on that. Thank you, Ms. Simard. This concludes our discussion about the industry challenges. Thank you to our great panelists for those very insightful opinions and views. Please let us give them a round of applause. This concludes our first workshop of the afternoon. The next workshop will start at 3 p.m. Thank you. Workshop of the fifth ICAO World Aviation Forum Innovation Fair. My name is Nivin Murat, Associate Analysis Officer with the Air Navigation Bureau, and I will be your moderator. We are delighted again to have great panelists from the industry to discuss innovation in aviation. Please join me to welcome our distinguished guests for this workshop, Mr. Luca Gianoli, Chief Technological Officer at Humanitas Solution. Mr. Marco Ruekert, Lead AI Solutions at Sierra Rich Technologies. <laughs> Mr. Andrew Taylors, Chief Solution Officer for NATS Digital Towers. <laughs> Mr. Mark Moore, Engineering Director of Elevate Systems at Uber. <laughs> Mr. Edward Hu, Chief Scientific Officer at IHANG. And on my left, Mr. Jean Paquin, President and Chief Executive Officer of SAF Plus Consortium. The workshop objectives are to discuss the challenges faced by the industry when dealing with innovation. In more details, we want to discuss the following questions. What challenges you had to overcome to be where you are right now? And what new challenges do you foresee in the future? What do we need to easily enable innovation in aviation? What are the biggest challenges in adopting innovation? What are the economical and societal benefits of innovation? I will now invite each panelist to share their point of view. We will start with Mr. Ruekert. Mr. Ruekert, did you encounter resistance or challenge getting new te technology accepted by the air traffic controller, or do you foresee any challenge while deploying new technology? Thanks, Nevin. 
Um, so um, for us, it was always a challenge being in the leading edge of innovation in our industry, uh, that there was no precedent when we introduced our new technology. So from a regulated perspective, when we first started working on digital and remote tower, um, nobody really knew what was good enough, what was the technology, uh, and what do we need to strive to. Uh, so when we first started creating remote towers using cameras, no, there was no precedent of using cameras in a control tower. Um, so the first challenge that we had faced is that we were forced to recreate exactly what the controller was seeing out of the window. So sometimes when we first started, we were using high definition cameras and for example, we were able to see better at nighttime than the human eye could. Um, from a technology perspective, that is great. Um, we should be able to provide a better information to the air traffic controller than they had before. However, we encountered some resistance from different controller working uh, workshops uh, and different regulators that what we need to display to the controller to make the decision has to be exactly what they had before, which is the out of the window view. So that is one of the examples what we had to work with uh, over 10 years to then accept the, get the acceptance from the industry and regulator that providing something that is better is also equivalent to what they can see out of the window. There's uh, continuous challenges right now when we provide our uh, digital tower solutions um, such as that um, we need to provide a certain level of pixel on target. That is a metric that identifies how much resolution there is on a target. Uh, so for example our um, Colorado operation in Fort Collins uh, has a lot of circuit traffic and what we challenge with is to provide enough high definition cameras in order to identify aircraft in the circuit. Um, so one of the things that came out of Fort Collins is that you can not easily judge a object on a 2D panel, uh, is it five nautical miles out, is it 10 nautical miles out in the circuit. Um, so working with the controller continuously um, through an agile circus, uh, circuit, um, giving us feedback and us adapting our system continuously, we were then able to curve our video wall, uh, which then already provided the controller with a better way to judge depth in the video wall. So what we really try to do is work with the end user, that is the air traffic controller, cut out the middleman and get the engineers talking directly to the air traffic controller, which we also do in our digital tower laboratory in Heathrow, um, where we trial new technology and before we bring it into the operation, we make sure that it fits the end user requirements and that they have tried it out before and they can give us some feedback before it then goes into the operation. Um, so when we talk specifically about artificial intelligence, which is an area that we progress in more and more and now, again, we are faced with the regulator not knowing how do we certify artificial intelligence solutions. How do we make sure it's safe? How do we make sure it's safe all the time when there's no precedent? Um, so those are the kind of things that we face today. So the way that we do that, again, is we trial the technology in life operation. We build up the confidence to the end user, and then only when the end user is comfortable do we bring it in full operation. Thank you, Mr. Rickert. My next question is for Mr. Taylors. Mr. Taylors, can you tell us about some lessons you learned or challenges you, you encountered while introducing new technologies to a group of highly skilled professional like air traffic controllers? Thank you. Uh, so my experiences uh, do reflect uh, some of the things that Marco spoke about just a moment ago with regards to uh, the best way to uh, bring new technology into an operation is to allow the people that are going to be operating that technology at an early site of that and also to have uh, an ability to have some input into the way that that uh, system uh, is going to operate to make sure that it's optimal for them. Um, so certainly when it came to deploying uh, the 4K digital tower at uh, Heathrow, uh, the key for us there was that while the air traffic controllers at Heathrow are particularly skilled in uh, performing their duties in their current control tower, to be able to take them into the future, and we want that future to be something which is uh, adopted more quickly than we've seen in the past technologies being rolled out into operations. Uh, the best way to do that would be to immerse the controllers in that technology. So uh, using the uh, availability of, of operational data um, and integrating that with uh, new camera sensors and displaying that in the world's first 4K digital display uh, enabled the controllers on shift to come downstairs uh, into the basement of the control tower uh, where you would expect uh, 
uh, from an air traffic controller's perspective that uh, that they would they would uh, feel that uh, that it wasn't as good an experience as uh, as being in the control tower itself, but quite the opposite, in fact, because uh, what they were encountering then was uh, an immediate ability to compare what they'd just been seeing out of the window uh, in the live operation with whatever the weather conditions were at the time, and then to be able to see what that looked like uh, using camera sensors um, with uh, 4K definition. Uh, and also with integration of our ground surveillance, our ASMGCS multilateration uh, included uh, with that, processed by the software. So it was a different experience in the way that the, even the, the labels uh, and the data blocks move across the screen in comparison to how that is on, on the radar screens uh, normally because the, uh, the digital tower provides additional um, processing. Uh, which means that the, the labels themselves are smoothed. And they're also looking at this in a, uh, in a view which is across the airport rather than a plan view, which is the way that they're used to seeing that kind of data presented. So uh, things like label overlap uh, become then uh, a different perspective because you're now uh, presenting labels which not only potentially overlap with each other, they could overlap information uh, of uh, airport um, geography uh, or other aircraft or vehicles. So again, being able to work with the software engineers and the air traffic controllers directly uh, meant that they could even give instant feedback, which allowed us uh, to provide very quick changes that they could then assess uh, potentially during their next shift uh, on duty. So it, it became a very different experience for the controller in that uh, rather than uh, seeing the technology presented to them at the point at which we are starting training and, and deployment for the controllers actually seeing it at the point at which we are configuring it and enhancing their, their current views. So it, it, it didn't take very long before uh, the controllers started coming in and then starting to make requests as to uh, could this function be added? Could you integrate this data? Um, and that actually is a very rich source uh, from people who uh, live today's operation, know its constraints, uh, and are um, very now open to uh, being provided with, uh, with solutions that they know that they can influence themselves. So again, what you actually find is that you're supplying the solution to the controller in a way that they're going to understand uh, which, when it comes to then implementing that into the operation, means uh, there's uh, more of an intuitive uh, use. In the same way that we've all got very used to our smartphones and taking uh, new applications on that, uh, without having to have a huge manual to read and, and lots of time before we're proficient in operating, things become a lot more intuitive uh, because they've been developed by that end user um, and they are specifically targeted to... Uh, make the, the operation of today somewhat easier, uh, remove uh, restrictions uh, from weather impacts, uh, from lack of direct visibility from, uh, from a control tower position, uh, all sorts of different, uh, different approaches. And, and I would say that we've also seen that uh, when we've worked uh, beyond uh, our own domestic operation um, in, uh, in places as far away as, uh, as Singapore for us uh, in, in UK with our Canadian partners uh, similarly working with us there. Um, and, and again, uh, working through that kind of approach where the controllers are involved in uh, development uh, sprints, as we would call them. So uh, the feedback is taken, uh, configuration and software enhancements are made, and the data uh, and output is then presented back to them for them to validate immediately uh, as to whether it's an improvement, an improvement that could still be improved further. Uh, and I think uh, that's, that's showing us some very positive results. Uh, on the opposite end of the scale, uh, from the point of view of other lessons learned, really, uh, one of the things that, uh, that, that strangely becomes um, probably one of the factors that people tend to overlook is the impact that the technology can have on, uh, on people's um, domestic arrangements, etc. So while at Heathrow uh, we're deploying the technology directly on site, uh, when it comes to potentially uh, the other end of the scale and you're perhaps remoting a very small or simple operation, what can actually become more important to the air traffic controller is the fact that they're now moving uh, their family to a different location because while they're working at the same airport, the location they're going to be operating it from moves. 
Um, so actually, quite often we're finding now that the technology is uh, is something which which we are very used to. That's that's part of our our modern lives. Uh, but the 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 impact on uh, on people's uh, out of work uh, lifestyle uh, is uh, is something which actually becomes the greater talking point. Um, but for us in general, the uh, the remoting of our operations is uh, is a very small part of it. The main part that we're looking at is uh, is ensuring that we can deploy uh, more capable systems that are less impacted by disruption so that we can deliver uh, an operation uh, today the same as yesterday and the same tomorrow which i think is a real key for us um, and i think my final point with regards to to kind of lesson learning is is what uh, we've all seen as as passengers when we go through an airport that uh, that things have changed dramatically and particularly because of the smartphone in our hands but from the air traffic management side of things we put those smartphones away and we operate in a way that we've operated for a very long time so um, the fact that we are used to that technology uh, i think our operational staff are very much uh, ready and embracing that particularly when it's it's their part of that uh, that development and deployment thank you mr taylor's Mr. Gianoli, what are the lessons you learned through the years and what advices can you give us to achieve a successful relationship between academia and industry community in a context of innovation? Thank you for the question, Nevin. So me at Humanitas, I'm part of a, of a very strong team of specialists and engineers from very different domains. But for sure, I can claim that these teams become stronger if you consider all the researchers and students, all our academic partners that help us every day within the development of our ecosystem. And uh, we have the chance in, this, uh, in the last three years to collaborate with uh, nine uh, universities from Quebec and Ontario and uh, you know in, in, in three major R&D projects that are involving up to 50 researchers including professor graduate students and postdocs you can see this is a considerable amount of brains and ideas that are uh, make our team more richer and it's very it, it, it's very unlikely that uh, when we have a challenge or something that uh, nobody knows what to do we have so many uh, let's say domains that are covered within this team and uh, for sure, it's not just the, uh, the, this collaboration with university help us also because as a startup, our name becomes more uh, known even within the university by there are students that are finishing their studies and they get to know us. And so we have access to talents that then now are part of the team that otherwise probably would have not known us. And uh, how to make this collaboration work? For sure, it wouldn't be, it wouldn't be possible without the help of programs from like there are, here in Canada we are very lucky there are many programs from the federal uh, the, the provincial level we have the chance to to have the support of an organization like CREAC, CARIC, uh, PROMPT, MITAX, the Minister of Economic and, uh, and the Innovations that allowed us to to, to set up this big R&D project and collaborate with the universities and uh, for sure, in this in a world where uh, the open innovation model is the key to foster the, the technology revolution that we live, uh, let's say every year, uh, collaboration is uh, uh, collaboration is the key. But uh, collaboration is also as uh, as also some drawbacks that have to be proactively managed. And uh, if I'm in the collaboration between industry and academia, we find that uh, industrial partners, typically like us, we are mostly focused on let's say technology readiness level, so we call TRL, so to on technology that are quite mature. We consider TRL from six to nine, and we have the need of try to, to go into the field to obtain results as soon as possible to make, to have an impact, to, have, to make a difference. While on the academic uh, perspective, it's very important to work on fundamental research uh, and, uh, and to work on so less mature technology, we call TRL from one to four. And uh, so, uh, and their their output, their most important has to be publication and the dissemination of the knowledge. So, to uh, to have a successful collaboration, we have to find a way to guarantee a convergence between two, to these two different approaches to the to the innovation. And uh, how to do this? But first, uh, it's very important to to have, I would say, a bi-directional, very uh, deep uh, vetting process between the 
professors and the, and the company, so we have to know each other well. And there are programs even in Canada to allow to have like six months collaboration to, with professors to get to know each other and then see if basically there's a fit between us. And then it becomes also very important to, uh, at the beginning, when so during the phase of setting up the project, uh, to really clearly define rules for example IP sharing this is a very sensitive uh, matter how to do the what are the mandates what are the deliverable expected it's very important to be very crystal clear from the beginning and uh, also for startup situation I would say that it can be even a little bit more difficult because as I said the big companies mo uh, many times tend to see research labs as a kind of uh, as a way to outsource sometimes some of the r and d and so let's say they do not uh, they just maybe require like a weekly by weekly or monthly meeting to update on the results, but they tend to mostly uh, ask for results and then use them well say when the research has been completed while in our case we really need to have a daily collaboration with them we ask the researcher to be with us with the team on the place to work together so we really need a tight collaboration and so it becomes even more important to have uh, clear mandates to know what the researchers are doing, what the internal team is doing, to avoid then uh, to, to avoid confusion between among the responsibilities, and for sure it would uh, help during the selection phase when we try look, are looking for candidates to help us. Uh, there are people that are more attracted, let's say, by applied science, so they are really, and also by the startup world, and uh, they feel uh, it is a very interesting part of their career. Uh, but uh, I was saying there is a kind of shortage also a little bit of, uh, of skills for companies, even for universities, when let's say we have to find postdocs and uh, students with our professor, it's not easy to find the right candidate. So if we keep adding constraints or what is the best candidate in the end, then it becomes complicated to, to fill the poll of all the resources you, you like to need. So we have to try to, to be a little bit more flexible and negotiate and find the best uh, deal and the best uh, condition of to work together on an on a individual basis. Thank you, Mr. Gianoli. Uh, Mr. Moore, the Elevate program aims at transforming the future of urban mobility. Can you share with us some challenges you had to overcome and what new challenges do you foresee in the future? Sure. Um, so Uber is actually, I think, getting quite comfortable with overcoming challenges. Um, you know, if you think about it, we're just uh, a few years old in terms of introducing an entirely new business model with uh, ride sharing transportation. And today, we do over 15 million trips a day and have done over 15 billion trips in the short history of our company. So over, overcoming the challenge of introducing a completely new business model is at the core of, uh, of who we are. And so with Elevate and introducing vertical takeoff electric air taxis, oh my goodness. There's uh, so many challenges to speak about, but um, I come from a per, you know from NASA. I was at NASA for 32 years, and I know the technologies really well. And uh, spent 10 years putting them into flight demonstrators and ringing them out, and knew that they were ready for commercialization. And so we're at this really cool point where it's not the technology challenge, and it's not even so much the regulatory challenge because. Uh, the FAA is working with us tremendously to get the standards in place with organizations like ASTM so that these new technologies can integrate into these new type of aircraft that have never existed before, right? They're halfway between a helicopter and an aircraft, and they come in all shapes and sizes and, and you know, look like uh, it's just the wild, wild west of aviation uh, where... You have all these new degrees of freedom and the aircraft look completely different than what they've ever looked like before. So um, the neat thing is the challenge that we're just overcoming and that the public is about to experience over the next six months is that our partners are developing these aircraft, Bell, Boeing. Um, we have 10 different partners who at their own cost are developing these aircraft while real estate partners are developing the infrastructure, the sky ports, we're focusing on developing the network connectivity and airspace management. But the real challenge is that all of these have to come together in one integrated 
solution. And we're doing this as a collaborative ecosystem where everyone's bringing you know, their tech and their pieces to combine. So it really is, the challenge is, is that this is a, an orchestra and everybody's got their own instrument and you gotta make sure everyone's playing the same tune. And in, to help do that, you know, one of the things that, one of the tools we've used is essentially to create a forcing function where um, essentially we, we know the market side, right? We've got that incredible amount of demand of 15 million trips a day. So essentially we've created this forcing function to have all the pieces come together as a single jigsaw puzzle that has a beautiful shape to it. And so we have uh, this, uh, this integration that will take place in 2023 uh, with the first three cities of Dallas, Los Angeles, and Melbourne, Australia. And um, the really neat thing is the infrastructure is being built today. The aircraft are flying experimentally today, and they already achieve the range and the performance that we need. And they're all electric, so they're environmentally responsible with zero emissions. Um, but the coolest thing is they've overcome the challenge that I really, really hoped they would. And that is they're really quiet. And so I have heard with my own ears that they are, in fact, more than 15 decibels quieter than the quietest helicopter. And to put that in, into perspective, that's... that's uh, that's so quiet that if it flies overhead at, at three to 400 meters altitude, you can't even hear it on the ground. That's a real challenge. Um, so, you know, my message is, uh, we've had a lot of challenges to overcome, but you know, um, we're in this really magical time when it almost seems like anything is possible as collaboration and innovation is truly encouraged uh, by organizations such as ICAO and ASTM and across the board, there's just so many degrees of freedom to achieve really wondrous things. And uh, we live in privileged, really privileged times. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Moore. My next question is for Mr. Xu. What challenges Ihan had to overcome to be where you are right now? And what new challenges do you foresee in the future? Thank you, Nevin, for the question. So as Ihan, uh, you know, our target is to provide the, you know, the whole solution for the urban air mobility. So first on the product, we need to devise, design the product that is uh, very safe and smart and eco-friendly. This looks like a very simple target, but to make this happen, it really requires a lot of efforts and technology involved in it. So to be safe, for example, we develop from the normal drone, so it's a passenger drone, but it's definitely different from a normal drone because a normal drone is small and also it has an equal weight. For example, but if you want to carry passengers on the drone, the situation will be more complicated because we are carrying two passengers and some passenger may be a children can, with a weight of you know, uh, 10 or 20 kilos. But if it might be a big guy which will have a weight of over 100 kilos. So how to make the drone to adapt itself to a different weight and, and it goes very smoothly? That's a big challenge on, on technology. And the second, for example, a drone, a normal drone is very small. It can speed up and, and stop very quickly. But uh, suppose a drone weighs about 600 kilos in the air, how to make it and control it very smoothly? That's another question. So we, uh, we were confronted with so many different questions and challenges, and we need to tackle them. And also in terms of smartness, we try to make them you know, automatic. That means in our drone, we don't have any pilots on it. 
And this is definitely a very big challenge, and there is nothing before, right? So autonomous driving on the ground is already a very new big challenge. Autonomous flying in the air is even more challenging. So our concept is based upon command control center. We use centralized command control and use cluster management technique. So which means that our command control center can give orders and control hundreds or even thousands of aircraft in the sky. That is a picture we paint for, for the future. And right now, we are implementing it. For example, we are using this uh, command control to con control over about 2,000 uh, small drones to give performance with the light shows in the sky. So this is a core technique we have. And we are going to build our platform based upon this techni technique and for our future urban air mobility solution. And also, uh, from a regulatory perspective, I believe there is also a challenge because this is a definitely a new thing. And we don't have any existing regulation or laws that says this will not happen or will happen. And also, we believe that our product is totally different from the conventional aircraft because we are flying at a lower attitude, at a slower speed, but it also requires the, the compromise between the existing regulation, which is more strict, and our, our, our aircraft or product uh, does not require you know, uh, such a strict uh, uh, you know, regulations. So, 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 et cetera. So I think for, for us, you know, it's a new product and we need to persuade the government or regulator, regulators and we need more collaboration. And for example, in China, we work closely with CAC, which is the authority of China uh, civil aviation for a lot of test or pilot programs. For example, we have successfully launched the, the passenger flight in Zhejiang province, eastern part of China, which did very well uh, in terms of the range and also the, the safety record. And our next plan is to launch our passenger service in downtown of Guangzhou, which is the fourth largest city in China. And going forward, I believe that it will take more time for us to further prove ourselves with more data and more track record to show the reliability and the safety. And as we believe that uh, safety is a top priority, and uh, to that end, we have made so many you know, efforts and also we input a lot of R&D activities to ensure the uh, safety. And for example, in, in our network of communication, so far we are using 4G network for uh, communication. But what if this uh, communication is cut off? So that means we have the backup system. So before the aircraft can take off, it will do some self-internal detection if anything goes wrong, it will not fly. And even if it flies, it will have this uh, backup system so that all the information of the flight and the routes are uploaded into the aircraft before it fly. So that even if anything happened and uh, the communication is cut off, it can automatically complete its uh, scheduled flight. So that's all the situation, but going forward, we may face even more risks and uh, unexpected uh, situations. And we are trying to explore the, the potential solutions to all kinds of things. Uh, but we believe that uh, with our efforts and uh, with uh, sufficient input in R&D, and especially with the support uh, with uh, the government and authorities, uh, we are going to build a brighter future for the urban air mobility and we, we are positive on the outlook uh, for the future. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Su. Uh, Mr. Pakin, what do you consider to be a valuable contribution for your endeavor to become a reality? Well, um, of course, the, the, the market, um, the market um, has a, a large um, objective and development need 
ahead. Uh, the aviation industry, as opposed to some of my colleagues here, we haven't uh, fully developed a, a, a solution yet. Uh, we're aligning the solution for the needs of the market. Um, but what we see uh, in the market is that um, there is um, obviously the regulations and the obligations um, in that market that will push from top down, uh, down to the uh, airline industries, that obligation to offset uh, their carbon footprint. Now, an aviation, uh, an airline a company has many ways of actually doing that, or a few ways to do that, uh, through the uh, offtake um, uh, and uh, credit uh, offtake and, and some agreements uh, to uh, uh, offset their uh, carbon footprint. They also have access to a likely technology improvement like we're hearing today uh, and we've heard during the course of this forum. But the major uh, source of that um, offsetting uh, for the carbon footprint uh, will likely, uh, and, and has been said on uh, numerous occasions during the course of those two days, uh, through the, um, um, the, the, the sustainable aviation fuel or access to sustainable aviation fuel for the industry. Um, we are uh, currently um, in partnership with a, a large, a fairly large uh, airline uh, here in Montreal, and uh, the discussions we have around the table always come to the same, um, the same thing, right? They're always around when uh, is this accessible. So maybe to turn this into, um, you were asking about challenges, and I'd like to turn this also into the challenge, uh, if you allow me. Um, the, the, the challenges. In, in what we have is in, in w the endeavor we're putting together uh, are around the um, mainly in, around the energy that we're going to be needing, but energy not only to develop this, but energy, physical energy to actually uh, create the fuel. Um, and, and, and it's one of the challenge because if you want to reproduce, and there will be a need for reproduction of this solution uh, around the world and in other areas uh, such as, uh, of course, the United States, Europe, and around uh, the rest of the world, uh, the, the, the access to a clean energy will be part of a challenge for us. Um, and uh, if you add up to those challenges, the pricing uh, of the actual uh, SAF for sustainable aviation fuel will also be a, a tremendous challenge. Um, the discussions we used to have in the past uh, years with uh, the industry and the airlines in general was uh, they, they were not really willing and open to discussion over uh, paying a premium for sustainable aviation fuel. Uh, now those, discuss those discussions are changing. Uh, they are looking for uh, new ways to uh, uh, tackle this problem, to uh, address the issue of pricing, and that will be for us a, uh, a, tremendous, um, a tremendous work uh, in, in making this a feasible uh, solution, a long-term feasible solution for the airline industry. If I can ask you to elaborate more on how does your project contribute to achieving Corsia's objectives? Yeah, thank you. Well, um, the, 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 the objectives that are set by Corsia are fairly clear. I mean, we don't really need to go over this. Most of you have seen uh, the curves and you've seen the requirements over the next uh, 30 years or so. Uh, they're stringent. They're, they're tough. Uh, constraints for the industry, uh, and solutions are required. I, I've seen this in other sectors of activity uh, where uh, carbon credits or, or renewable projects were necessary to uh, uh, balance some of the requirements of those uh, sectors and those industries. Same thing is applying here. Uh, Corsia is, is actually, in a way, setting the standard and setting, setting the obligation uh, for companies, uh, for airlines and companies like us to actually strive and to develop uh, solutions. And it's a good thing uh, because if it would be left to likely to the industry or maybe perhaps left to other uh, uh, local uh, government or, or entities uh, and regulatory bodies, uh, the, the process might not advance at the same pace. I think setting a, a very clear, sending a very clear and solid message today that this is required and setting the goals uh, for all the states to uh, develop uh, and, and use technology and offset measures for their, uh, the sustainability of the aviation industry is, is 
absolutely necessary. Um, of course, you will have a push from the bottom as well. You'll have a bottom-up approach where, and we're seeing this right now because we're, we're in the private sector. We're, we're talking also to the, uh, uh, the stakeholders and uh, the, bottom, uh, the bottom pressure is coming up to the airline industry, uh, to the stakeholders, uh, to the different uh, manufacturers, equipment manufacturers, technology developers, and, and people are asking for solutions. They're asking for answers. They want to know how they can fly uh, in a more sustainable way. Uh, how will that be addressed? Uh, what are the concrete solutions? May it be applications that, that they can use to offset their flights? Uh, but in, in essence, this, this is coming, it's, I call it a squeeze. It's, it's being squeezed from top and squeezed from bottom. And at one point, what that does is that it accelerates uh, uh, the creation of new solutions, such as uh, a sustainable aviation fuel. Thank you, Mr. Pakin. I would like to ask any of the panelists if uh, they want to comment on what we easily, what we need to easily enable innovation in aviation. Any of you? In the last minutes, I will just ask you to keep it very short and brief. Mr. Taylor. So I think the uh, key is, and it's been mentioned a number of times uh, in this panel, is collaboration. Um, and one of those key areas of collaboration, I think, is in data sharing. Um, so from uh, my own uh, part of, uh, of the air traffic management uh, industry within the, the control tower, uh, systems are very siloed at present. Uh, and the data that's available uh, within those uh, silos uh, would be much more valuable if uh, shared uh, across a more open platform uh, to enable us to develop applications, uh, open uh, the, uh, the, the control tower, the digital control tower, uh, to uh, more uh, suppliers and innovators uh, than perhaps uh, we traditionally have had. So uh, for me, the key thing is, is both collaborating uh, from a user level, but also collaborating uh, at, a, um, uh, at a supplier level so that uh, we can innovate and we can use the data and maximize uh, the possibilities from that. Thank you, Mr. Taylors. This concludes our discussion about the industry challenges. Thank you to our great panelists for those very insightful opinions and views. Please let us give them a round of applause. This concludes our last workshop of the day. Thank you for your participation and enjoy the rest of the Innovation Fair. <laughs>